suppression or censoring distressing thoughts what does that mean uh well as we'll see this has all types of different implications um so as i usually do the first slide i show is a list of the features of consciousness or conscious interiority for those of you who have been to my uh, talks before, of course, you'll be very familiar with this. Uh, for those of you, if this is the first time, some of this may not make a lot of sense right away, but hopefully that can be cleared up later on if you have any questions. And so today, as you can see, uh, we're going to be discussing, as I already have said, uh, suppression. Um, but like all these different features of conscious interiority, they actually interrelate and impact uh, each other in subtle ways. So the first slide uh, mentions what I think is a key problem when we discuss uh, Julian Jaynes and when we discuss the different features of uh, conscious interiority. And as I spell it out here, right now, it's my belief that in psychology, there is no adequate vocabulary or idiom to discuss psychological processes in a clear way, especially when it comes to something like consciousness. We use all types of different terminology and it can make things very confusing because often people are not on the same page and they're talking past each other. And I, I, I think a, a good intellectual exercise that we can use to get the point across is to consider uh, trying to explain to someone quantum physics um, who lived 150, 200 years ago. It simply would not make much sense. In fact, that's true of a lot of things in science today. Uh, you don't even have to go back that far. Um, and the, the, the issue here is as science evolves, it develops a new vocabulary that, in principle, is supposed to reflect what happens in the universe more accurately. And if, you, if, if we don't have that vocabulary, things become very confusing very fast. So that's why I think when we try to understand what Julian Jaynes is trying to say, we have to be very patient and have a sort of uh, an open-mindedness, open up our intellectual horizons, and uh, hopefully some of the ideas that we talk about today will make sense. And one uh, thing I'd like to talk about as part of a, a very modest attempt to deal with uh, this, this lack of an adequate vocabulary is to introduce these three terms. And I do this in an attempt to clarify what Jane's meant by consciousness or what I mean by conscious interiority. So, of course, uh, it, 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 well, let, let's begin with perception or the perceptual level. And what we're doing is we're looking at, we're looking at the human mind from three angles. And the first one, I, it's not very complicated, uh, sensory information and how the mind absorbs or takes in millions and millions of bits of information from the environment. And that process is completely non-conscious. It's something that we are not aware of. And then the next dimension of the human mind, we can call conceptual. And this is the realm of ideas and mental representations. And what I'm about to say, I think, sounds very counterintuitive for most of us. But in any case, like the perceptual level, the conceptual level is something that we are completely unaware of. It's non-conscious. And of course, as for those of you who are familiar with Julian Jaynes, you'll know that according to Jaynes, uh, up until about 1000 BCE, people only operated at the perceptual and conceptual level. There was no conscious interiority. So that brings us to the next level, what I call introceptual. And of course, this describes consciousness or conscious interiority. 
And this is the realm of the mind space. And within that mind space, something magical has happened, right? Beginning about 3,000 years ago. This is the realm, uh, it's a sort of intro cosmos or sort of introspectable world where interiorized concepts and interiorized percepts exist. And the, so the, I, I've emphasized those two words, interiorized. Okay, so we're not talking about concept, we're not talking about conceptions. We're talking about what happens to conceptions when they become interiorized. And we're not talking about perceptions. We're talking about perceptions or percepts that become interiorized. In other words, conscious interiority is sort of this magical mental process that takes non-conscious material and somehow, actually it's through metaphoric language, makes things interiorized and gives us this, this idea that we have an introspectable mind space. So again, that may be clear for some of us. It may not be that clear, but if you have any questions about that, uh, we can talk about that later. But I just want to introduce this way of looking at things now. So hopefully things that I'm, I'm going to be talking about in a few minutes will make more sense. So let's get back to this idea of suppression. What is suppression? Suppression, defined in Jamesian terms, is the conscious analog of the behavior of turning away from something that repels us, uh, anything, anything that uh, disgusts us. So that behavior, of course, happens at the conceptual and perceptual level. And then Sub, and, and then the analog of that type of physical behavior is something interiorized, suppression. So uh, to give another example, um, suppression is the opposite of concentration. And concentration, of course, is another feature of conscious interiority. Uh, so as you can see, as it's presented, concentration is interiorized percept slash concept. And so suppression is the, uh, excuse me, the, the analog of concentration is giving attention to something, a physical act. So in this context, attention is perception. Attention is not something we are conscious of. Okay. And again, that sounds counterintuitive. So you can see I'm struggling with trying to come up with a language that explains the very subtle, and very complicated way that Jane's talked about um, consciousness. So if this doesn't make any sense, of course, um, we can discuss this later, but I just want to lay the theoretical uh, background. So suppression means to consciously force unwanted information out of our awareness. But what's important about suppression, and you'll see why this is significant in a minute, is because it's something that we are aware of, we can be aware of sweeping things under the rug as it were, okay? So it means intentionally choosing not to indulge what is ordinarily accessible. Could be thoughts, sentiments, uh, something we've done in the past, something we're thinking about doing in the future, okay? But as I, just to repeat, to be clear, we are aware of this process of suppression. It is a feature of conscious interiority. So to switch gears a little bit here, let, I just want to introduce this idea of the non-conscious. And as we know, I think most people would agree, uh, most of mentation, most of our psychological processes are not conscious. Uh, Brian, can I make sure. uh, one, one point? I, I, the, this idea of analog mm -hmm. to what is going on outside, I think it's very, very powerful. Uh, I mean, and, in some ways, it's the heart of how Julian Jeans approaches things, kind of taking something outside and then doing a version of it inside as a way of making, you know, a, as a way of directing what is going on. So I, I really like your identification of suppression is avoidance, like you are actually pushing things away or looking away from things. That same kind of thing that is done outside is being done inside. Uh, and also it's a good way uh, the, the, the juxtaposition of that with attention, 
of saying you're looking at something uh, and going towards something, and yet that's what you're doing. So I I think I thought that this the analog uh, analog point was very powerful. Oh, good. Yeah, yeah, I, yeah. I'm, I'm, I hope it I hope it works. Uh, you know that that explanation because we're not used to talking this way. We're not used to making these fine distinctions between words in the English language or any language for that matter. And that's why researchers and many of us end up talking past each other. Because as I said a little while ago, we just don't have a vocabulary. I mean, we have a, a vocabulary to talk about things in the physical sciences that most people agree with. But when it comes to the social sciences or it comes to psychology, it's much more difficult. And so to, in order to understand Jane's, it's almost as if um, we have to build a, a different language. Um, that shows you, I think, how profound his thoughts were. So, um, so to get back to this idea of, of the non-conscious, I think it's really important. When I, when I deal with clients, I always remind them that there's so much going on inside their mind at any given moment that they're not aware of. And I think this is uh, something that we all need to be educated on. I mean, I, I think we know this fact, right? Um, that the, uh, the, 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 the non-conscious plays a role in our lives, but um, it's something I, I think that needs to, be, um, needs to be stressed because it can help demystify a person who is in stress to find out what is really bothering them and hopefully it can lead to some sort of insight. And this applies not just in a therapeutic setting, of course, this apl applies uh, to everyday life. So th this is very important, these two words. So I've been talking about suppression, but we wanna be very careful. We want, wanna make a distinction between suppression and a Freudian idea of repression. Um, and repression, of course, for the uh, Freudian psychoanalytic system, of psychotherapy is key. Uh, repression, uh, according to Freud, was a defense mechanism in which painful traumatic uh, events or thoughts um, are prevented from being, for, for, from uh, bubbling up to the conscious level. And th this uh, graphic here, um, I, I think pretty much um, explains the difference uh, between suppression and repression. So if you look under suppression, we can consciously suppress our impulses. However, with repression, we unconsciously deny. We, we, we don't even know they exist. We don't want to know that they exist. And so if you look at the individual um, uh, who puts on a cheerful front, you can see it's, it's very different from uh, the person who is uh, angry, who, who is uh, visibly angry. So repression is the, we might describe it as disposing uh, things in uh, the corners of our psyche. Uh, and again, this is just another graphic, I think that very conveniently shows us the difference between repression and uh, suppression. So with, re with uh, repression, unwanted impulses or thoughts um, are being unconsciously pushed out of awareness. Whereas with suppression, the thing we deliberately attempt to forget something or to not think about painful or unwanted thoughts. So with repression and its conceptual cousin, uh, dissociative amnesia, unwanted impulses are forced, are forced from our conscious mind uh, into uh, the non-conscious. So as I've already said, repression is a defense mechanism and it keeps anything objectionable or painful um, below the threshold of, of consciousness. And the, the idea here, of course, as we know, according to Freud was to guard the ego against any anxiety triggered by unacceptable uh, thoughts, whatever they have concern, a traumatic event, um, uh, it could involve um, being sexually molested, or it could uh, in, uh, involve sexual wishes that are, are socially unacceptable, unset unsettling memories, whatever the, the case may be. So, uh, again, 
this is a very common metaphor used to make this point about um, how what the mind is composed of and according to this graphic only five percent of brain activities are conscious the remaining 95 percent are unconscious or some people use the, the word um subconscious um okay so unlike suppression repression involves quarantining unpleasant thoughts, feelings, or impulses that do not subjectively register in the conscious regions of our mind. So th this, uh, I just pulled this image off of Google. Um, I think it's an interesting metaphor um, of, uh, of, of how the mind works. Probably this, I, I, I didn't research, I, I don't know who or when this was um illustrated but it looks like something from the 1940s maybe 50s and uh it's an interesting uh metaphoric way to uh view the mind and my uh wife happened uh, to point out to me if you look at this um there's only one or two figures that are female and they're secretaries and so uh, again it shows you how um how, how we view things in the social world, um, uh, our, our, our own conceptions are of course shaped by assumptions we make, um, not just about how the mind operates by, but by about um, relations between the sexes and the sexism for that matter. So theoretically repressed material cannot be made conscious by an act of will. So that is, so that, what is repressed is accessible only through therapy in principle. I don't think that's necessarily true actually, uh, but uh, many, some counselors might make that claim that if something is deeply repressed, really buried deeply, it can only be accessed through um, psychotherapy. But of course, with suppressed material that can be intentionally um, recall, uh, recalled. So related to this present discussion is this, this myth, I think, that some of us have. Um, I think some researchers prefer looking at, um, at, at, at a person as a being who, has, who, who is transparent to themselves, to sort of what we can call open book self-objectivity. But that's a myth. And in fact, that's why we have therapy. And this myth, for, for some of us, not all of us, but, but for some of us, it, of course, is a major obstacle uh, uh, to getting therapy or when, when we have entered therapy. Um, the idea is we think of many reasons and excuses why we don't want to talk about certain things. But just like the nose on our faces, um, it, it's not that easy to clearly step back, of course, to get to know ourselves. So whether you're, again, whether it's in a therapeutic session or an everyday session, these ideas um, apply. Um, and so that's, we can perhaps talk about that a little bit later, you know, this idea of self-objectivity. It's kind of a, um, I think it calls for a type of humility, uh, this idea to admit that there are things going on inside of ourselves that we're not necessarily aware of, um, that people look at us differently, that they see things about us that perhaps we're not aware of. So the therapeutic implications, uh, as we know, therapy can be used to have individuals edit mental contents, allowing them to increase self-objectivity in a way that should be non-threatening, right? And this relates to this idea of um, self-individuation. Uh, which is another feature of conscious interiority. So again, you can see how these different features are all very much interrelated. Okay, and you know, the idea here, of course, if especially if it's with a client or a patient who is really struggling, they have the urge to self-disclose, but they, uh, but there's another part of them that may not be aware exactly what the problem is, or they're not sure how to articulate it. It may be a problem of classic Freudian 
uh, repression, or it could be something a little more um, uh, less serious, I suppose, like suppression. But in any case, the point of all of, of therapy is to have a person um, uh, articulate whatever is bothering them. But it has to be done in such a way, and this is where it gets tricky, that it does not trigger other issues for the individual. Because then, of course, they just put up more walls and it, be, it can become more difficult to, uh, uh, to treat them. So getting to know ourselves is as much a challenge as getting to know others. And again, um, I think many of us assume that we know ourselves very well. And I think it depends on the individual. I think some people do know themselves better than others. But the idea here is we should never assume that we know ourselves as well as we do, because after all, we are evolving, changing beings. We have different life experiences. Um, when we look back on our past, we change our perceptions of things. Things start to make sense, um, perhaps, maybe they don't. But in any case, uh, th th this is a very important idea of um, we, we should always be challenging this myth of uh, the open book self. And of course, uh, the, the key issue here, a big reason why we have a difficult time getting to know ourselves is because most of our cognition is not conscious. Most cognition is not conscious. And that we, we assume that we are conscious of what goes on in our head or we're, we're conscious of most of what goes on in our head. And of course, that's, uh, uh, that bolsters this idea of self-objectivity. So we should be constantly challenging ourselves, uh, sort of incessant self-introspection. There are many ways to do this. The best way is to be humble, uh, to listen to what others have to say, whether they're family, friends, uh, spiritual leader. Um, that, that, that I think is, a, of course, a, a good place to start. Um, and of course, acknowledging the role of non-conscious processes can help us um, get, get to know ourselves better. We, we can perhaps see our own identity um, more clearly, and we can see how we impact others, right? Um, I often, I, I've worked with clients who perhaps they have a bit of a temper um, they need uh, perhaps some anger management lessons. And for, for some of them, it's a surprise when they begin to realize, they surprise themselves when they begin to realize how angry they are. They're, they have normalized their anger, which comes out in, uh, in different ways, maybe as sarcasm, passive aggressiveness. And uh, it's so, sometimes a shock to them to find out how they have been impacting other people. And of course, the, the, this, this, this is not, this has applications, not just in a therapeutic setting, but in, in any, uh, also in the um, everyday context. So recently, uh, there's a lot of talk of implicit biases um, and of course, all of us like to think we don't have them. Um, I, 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 uh, I, I, think, I think, of course, we, we all do to some degree. Um, it's an uncomfortable conversation that we have to have with ourselves. Um, but uh, this, these, un, these implicit biases can have to have to do with um, how we view the other sex, how we review um, sexual diversity, perhaps, how we view other uh, ethnicities or races or people from different classes or different occupations. Uh, of course, it, it could be anything. And so this is where, this is why the non-conscious admitting or acknowledging the existence of the non-conscious and how we can uh, unawares shape our interaction with other people is so important. I think another way to talk 
about this is this idea of values and to ask ourselves, have I really done a value inventory? Uh, we get so used to assuming that we know ourselves. We get so used to assuming that, look, I know what my own morals are. I know what my, I, I, I have some sort of, it may be vague, but I have some sort of uh, uh, ethical viewpoint. But often um, I think we actually forget what our values and morals are because we don't necessarily inventory them in a concrete manner. Um, and uh, th 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 uh, this is something, of course, uh, that I think um, uh, is, is vital to uh, society uh, values. But the problem is, um, just let me skip ahead here. I, 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 this is uh, uh, just to jump ahead to the final thought. I think many of us um, when we hear the word values, we might think of religion or something old fashioned, it sounds a little bit judgmental. And that's why in therapy, it, it, it's just my opinion, but counseling for years has sort of struggled with this idea of values. And the idea in principle is that uh, a counselor should not impose his or her values on a client. And sometimes that's misinterpreted by people to mean that there's, that value should play no role in counseling. And uh, of course, I disagree with that. Uh, the question is, what role should they play? And how should values be looked at uh, in a, a counseling setting? But, um, and uh, just, just to go back to this previous slide, uh, I, I, to, to comment on the why understanding our own values can be so complicated. And that's because they change and evolve uh, into our, uh, in reaction to changing circumstances as we go through life. So in any case, um, I'll end there with this final thought, uh, the, 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 you know, perhaps this should be, um, a question, uh, what role should values play? Why, why not for everybody? I mean, if, of course, if you consider yourself a very religious or spiritual person, your values are going to be more explicit. It's something that is going to be in the front burner of your mind as it were something you'll be thinking about. But I think for other people who perhaps um, are uh, uh, don't, they're not necessarily anti-religious, but they don't take religion so seriously, um, perhaps uh, and, and assume that they do have values. And I'm not saying that they don't have values, but, but the point I'm making is that we should at least try to make an attempt to clarify what our values are um, and see if there are parts of ourselves that we are repressing or suppressing that somehow relate to um, uh, uh, our own values. So in any case, um, I'll end there and I'll be more than happy to uh, take uh, any questions. Well, wonderful, thank you. Thank you, Brian. All right, folks, so it's time for uh, questions. Uh, go ahead and type exclamation mark. Um, and uh, let, let me put the first question. Uh, Ayala was asking, where would you draw the line between uh, inhibition, which is uh, a necessary social living skill and suppression? That's a good question. And I, I like that question because it um, forces us again to be more nuanced and subtle with the words that we use to describe psychological processes. So, um, so suppression, the way I've been talking about it is it, it, it involves volition and a decision that you are aware that you're taking something and sweeping it under the rug. You may not be 100% aware, but you pretty much have a, an, an idea uh, where with uh, in, inhibition, that again, people might use the word a little bit differently depending on the context, but to me that sort of has a, a feel of um, something that is um, uh, a, a little more non-conscious perhaps, or it could relate to a fear that you haven't confronted directly. Um, and, you know, th th this actually, this present issue relates to 
should we should we view suppression and repression on a sort of continuum where it's a matter of degree? In other words, it's not either or. That might be too simple a way to look at things. That something is either uh, Jamesian uh, suppression versus Freudian repression. I, I think there's a I think there's a lot of room for, uh, uh, as I said, some, some sort of grading or uh, a continuum and perhaps inhibition falls somewhere on that continuum. Thank you. Next up is going to be Dave followed by Mike. Folks, uh, to ask questions, go ahead and type exclamation mark or raise your hand in Zoom. Dave. Thanks, Shikhan. Good morning, Brian. Wonderful talk as always. <clears throat> and this may be a little bit off topic, but one of your earlier slides, you talked about <clears throat> sensing being unconscious or sensory. Uh, and I, I, as an engineer, I, I'd like to talk about a level that, okay, I'm looking at the window about my, you know, my neighbor's house across the street, and it's always been there, and it is kind of subconscious. But if I walk down the street and I step on a tack, or I touch a hot stove, immediately that comes to my conscious mind. So is there maybe a level of perception that sorts out between the conscious and unconscious? Yeah, so when you step on a tack, that is, um, that is as far as your body and your mind are concerned, that is a big time emergency. And so that is an instance where consciousness will spring into action. Sort of like James described consciousness as a repairman running around a house trying to fix everything. And so when something novel in your environment happens or there's some sort of problem that must be confronted with immediately, not always, but usually those are the times when you're gonna be very conscious. Um, whereas, you know, as you said, looking out a window, you may not notice everything. Somewhere in your mind, something is being noticed um, when you perceive things. And uh, James used the term um, uh, reactive perception or, pe or perceptual reactivity, where your body is always reacting to the environment, but you're not really necessarily conscious of all those reactions. You're only conscious of a reaction when things don't work, when you step on attack, when something happens to you, where uh, that repairman of consciousness um, has to fix a problem. So I'm not sure if that uh, uh, clarifies your, um, your question. Uh, sorry, D Dave, would you like a follow up or? No, that, that uh, yeah, just, just to seem to me that the slide was a little counterintuitive, but I still understand that you're saying about, uh, yeah, the emergency response to whatever brings it right up in the conscious. And I completely agree with that, of course. Thank you. Thank you, Dave. Uh, next up is going to be Mike. Mike, go ahead. Um, I'm trying to put all everything together, which you kind of did, but I'm not quite sure I understand it and how this uh, concept of censorship uh, fits within the bicameral mind. Um, along the, uh, these lines, we covered another uh, book on uh, the master and his emissary by Ian McGilchrist, and I came across another book. Uh, by the uh, stroke of genius lady, Jill Balty Taylor, who wrote a book about the whole brain and referenced and credited Julian James for some of, uh, some of his stuff. Uh, but uh, my understanding is that the right brain sees everything and it's a chaotic jumble of too much. Uh, often and uh, can't make uh, can't uh, decide on an action, and the uh, uh, the left brain uh, is kind of the uh, sensor and the organizer uh, of uh, making sense of these and trying to get purposeful behavior out of what the right brain sees. Uh, what the uh, what the left brain sees. I may be confusing these. I may be. I'm not confusing them in my own mind, but I may be saying the wrong thing for each side. Um, in the bicameral mind, is that kind of uh, 
division of labor uh, of uh, sensor and um, and data uh, and data pre-processing going on in the bicameral mind and that accounts for the things that are in your slides and can, can you clear all that up thank you okay um thank you mike for that question so that that's a that, that that's an important question um in response I, I have to say i'm not a neurologist so i always get a little bit nervous talking about right brain left brain um but I do think that uh, in general, it is true that the right brain uh, does focus on certain tasks um, that are a bit different from the left brain. Um, and you talked about how perhaps, I think you were referring to someone um, who made the argument that perhaps the left brain is the sensor and is trying to figure out all this jumble of information uh, going on in the right brain but um i don't know if james would agree with that um james when james talked about left brain right brain his argument had to do with where are hallucinations originating and what part of our neurological apparatus and it had to do with speech because hallucinations not many not all but many hallucinations of course are auditory and so uh when james talked about left brain right brain it was in the context of explaining uh hallucinations not so much this idea of censoring information or um how the left brain tries to give some sort of order from the more chaotic right brain if you will i don't know if james would deny that's happening um, and I, I'm not saying that does not happen, um, but that issue itself does not necessarily relate to, um, I, well, I think that issue actually is often more of a non-conscious process. It may rise to the level of, level of consciousness. I'm not saying that it can't or it doesn't, um, but in any case, um, that, that, that may be a different, uh, a different issue. Sorry, thank you. Uh, next up is going to be Alex. Alex, go ahead. Hello, Brian. So first of all, thank you for all the useful information, very concise and clear. And my question is, um, would you recommend any techniques that a person could do on their own to help surface repressed memories or thoughts so that we know each other better and explore each other, explore ourselves? Sure. Um, well, there are, uh, of course, many techniques, many things that you can do. And I think one place to begin is to ask yourself, to ask ourselves, what type of people are we? So some people are uh, view things from a more intellectual verbal angle, and they're comfortable with talk. They're comfortable with writing, which is a very complex process. Where and then there are other people who may, you know, they may be very intelligent people, but rather than taking an abstract view to what's going on deep inside themselves, they take a more artistic, creative approach. Uh, then there are other people who are more bodily oriented, or we might say uh, somatic. And in order to do anything, it's good for that type of person to first do some deep breathing and relaxation before they start to look inward and do some serious self-introspection. So that's the first thing I would say. What type of person are you? And that may, you know, again, most of us perhaps don't think about that, but um, it shouldn't be too hard to, to figure out. Um, uh, you know, we all have our strengths and weaknesses and some people are very good with words. Some people are very good with drawing. Some people are very good getting in touch with their bodily sensations. Um, and so that's, that, 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 that's a place uh, to start. And then to be more specific, if you are someone who uh, is very comfortable with verbalization and listening to other people, you might start with some journaling. 
but it, it has to be, it, it can't feel like it's a task or an assignment. It has to be something that you're willing to do. And what I mean by that, um, just start off small. Just say to yourself, you know, for the next week, every day, I'm going to write one or two sentences, whatever comes to my mind. And then hopefully after two or three weeks of doing that, you're going to begin to write a little bit more. And any defenses that you may have are going to gradually be lowered. And you'll be, as you become more and more comfortable with that technique of writing and journaling. Another thing is to, uh, an, another technique is to listen to other people, how they react to you, not just their verbalizations, but how they react to you physically, what type of faces they make, their body language. View it as almost uh, a scientific experiment. And then when you feel comfortable, depends on the person, you might have a conversation with them, with that person. You know, what do you think about me? You know, that, that's maybe a little too sensitive for some people, but certainly it, it's something to consider, this idea of learning to humbly actively listen to other people and also uh, mindfulness when you're in, in the midst of doing something pay attention to what you're doing in the here and now at that moment rather than worrying about why i'm doing it or what's going to happen or about all, all the appointments i have tomorrow what, what, what's ever bothering you and as you develop this idea, uh, as you de develop mindfulness, hopefully things that are sort of perhaps frozen in your mind will start to um, thaw out. You'll start to feel more comfortable with any thoughts or emotions. And of course, it really depends on uh, what we're dealing with. I mean, if it's someone who has uh, trauma or something very painful that happened in their past, then these types of techniques have to be more focused and we have to walk through them step by step. And that's actually uh, you know, a whole nother uh, discussion um, and you, because we wanna be a little more careful, right? So if someone has trauma and if it's very serious, for example, they're suffering from PTSD, we just can't sit down and tell the person, hey, I want you to journal what happened to you and, and try your best to remember it and fill in all the details, that's usually not a good place to start. Some people might be able to handle that, but the idea is to wait until the client feels comfortable talking about these things. So wait until the client has built up some sort of therapeutic alliance with the counselor, and then they'll feel emotionally less vulnerable. They'll, they'll feel more comfortable talking about whatever they need to talk about. Thank you. Next up is Jeff. Hey, Brian, great to see you and, and thank you for this. Um, I, I wanna, uh, I'm curious about something just because of my, some of my experiences um, recently with folks where the, the reflection and you know, analysis and maybe you know, assessment um, of, uh, of perceptions is not um, only uh, about the past and not only about the present, but really, um, the you know an individual's predictions, if you will, regarding what they think is going to happen in the foreseeable future, and that the uh, you know the enthusiasm or the anxiety or the or the judgments uh, there you know when a person's feeling and thinking um, in consideration can be so strong, and, and it gets to even you know, uh, kind of projecting the purpose and what you're trying to achieve and, and why and what values you bring to it and maybe what norms you know you you're you're either afraid are not going to be observed or just agreements that are not going to be kept. But they're all sort of uh, the only word I can think about it in a sense is is predictions. Um, so in addition to past and present, is there anything? significant about how this plays out regarding how folks see, you know, a desirable or an undesirable future? 
Um, so yeah, thank you for that question. So that that's a, that's a great question, and I think this is um, this what you're talking about illustrates the advantages and disadvantages of conscious interiority, because conscious interiority gives us this mind space, and uh, it it, it uh, we're allowed to spatialize time, we're allowed to look back the past further, and we're also allowed to look toward the future further. And the advantage there is planning. Uh, when you think about uh, pre-industrial uh, economies, people uh, could plan better how to rotate their crops or food storage or building air irrigations, dams, whatever. So that, that's just one example of the advantages. But the disadvantage of having this uh, we, we can actually describe it using a feature of conscious interiority, self narrativization The disadvantage is that we do get stuck in the past or we get stuck, uh, I think, uh, we, well, we often get stuck in the future. Um, and uh, because we're given so many, we, we, uh, we hy hypothesize so many possibilities uh, of, of, of things that could go wrong it's endless, right? We start generating this menu of bad things that are going to happen. And then from each of those, each item that we generate, that leads off to other places that may be dark and worrisome for an individual. So that's a real uh, problem with having this feature of self narrativization So the, the practical issue, the practical question, of course, is how to deal with that. Um, and uh, I, I, I mean, just some basic uh, pointers, I suppose. Uh, uh, it, it, well, it depends on the person. Um, you might, well, I, I would begin with telling the person to make a distinction between their worries and th the thoughts they have for the future with the emotions associated with those thoughts to sort of defuse the thought and the emotion because it's it's the emotion that colors the thought and makes the thought become a problem we usually don't think that way right usually our thoughts and emotions are enmeshed and fused together but sometimes it makes a it can really help a person to be purely objective and to to defuse the thoughts and the emotions and then those thoughts it's almost as if those thoughts become the property of somebody else another person and we begin to see that our emotions can be um, somehow tamped down that our emotions do not have to determine how we view things and more concretely uh, you, you know you can talk to a person and walk them through that process or you can have them write down their thoughts and have them identify what are my emotions, what are my sentiments that are coloring my predictions. Um, and then, you know, the next step is basically to have the person see that any thoughts that they have, any worries or concerns or predictions that they have is just, it's not them. It's just a small part of what's going on inside their mind and have them open up uh, mental horizons that there are other ways uh, to look at the world. So in any case, that, that's, that, that's a place of how I would begin. Excellent. Um, Katie, go ahead and ask the question. What, what are you looking for example of? Uh, the, th the thought emotion, and maybe I'm thinking, cause I do NVC and I love these, uh, you know, taking a thought, I, Someone, someone actually just corrected me other, the other day where I thought a thought was an emotion. So it might be like a thought, like maybe like I'm, 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 I'm lovable or maybe someone doesn't like me or how, how would that relate? How would that might, that might relate to a, the analysis? Well, relate, yeah. So related to all this, um, I, I think a problem that many of us have is when we think of emotions, there's something impulsive and simple about emotions. We have this idea that emotions are bodily reactions which they are and they just sort of bubble up and then we put a name on it and we have a short l list of names that we use to describe emotions 
I'm happy, I'm scared, I'm mad, I'm sad. And I, but I think what we have to learn to do is to come up with, and you can get these, I'm sure you've seen these, you can get these anywhere online. Um, we might call them feeling inventories, a long list of words that describe feelings and emotions and sentiments um, not necessarily thought so much. And again, I know it's a little bit difficult to make a distinction between emotions and thoughts. But um, in any case, the idea is to provide somebody with a long list of words that describe how they're feeling and tell them when they start to feel depressed or they start to feel anxious or they start to feel that no one loves them, whatever sort of negative feeling they're having take out that list and go down that list and pick out five or six words that more objectively, more accurately, in a more nuanced manner, describe exactly how they're feeling. Because the problem is, if I say I'm mad, that's a poor type of communication. It's not clearly saying to the other person or to myself, why I'm mad. Maybe I'm not mad, maybe I'm more disappointed. Maybe I'm more frustrated. Maybe I'm just more annoyed about something. And so once we start describing things more accurately, and this shows us the, the power of language and how language itself can be a, a healing process. Once we start trying to describe our emotions more carefully and more clearly, what happens? We start to feel like we're in control. The feature of conscious interiority called self-autonomy becomes stronger. Self-autonomy starts to kick in. And then all these negative emotions that we had don't go away. This is not about erasing emotions, right? This is more about looking at emotions from a different angle and putting them in their place and gaining a, 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 a sense of security that yes, I may have these emotions, I may have these thoughts, but they do not completely define me. They're just a part of me. And in any case, many of these emotions, regardless of how intense they can be, will pass anyways. Next uh, is a question from Dave. Dave, go ahead. Yeah, Brian, uh, in my recovery work, I believe I recall uh, reading from a psychologist that when you have suppressed or, re or repressed things, that they will eventually evolve uh, physically or psychologically. Is that something you'd like to address this morning? Yes. Um, so that idea. Um, has been around for a long time, of course, um, and we often associate with Freud, but I think that Freud probably gets more credit than he deserves, but that, 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 that um, and I think that idea um, exists in what we might call folk psychology, or just sort of common sense psychology that many of us have, that if you're mad and angry all the time, that's not good for your blood pressure, it's not good for your digestion, um, so most definitely, I think that um, that is the case. I think that in the con in, in modern conscious times, we, we make a clear distinction, a dualism between mind and body. And so when something is affecting you physically, you go and you see your primary care physician. If something is impacting you mentally, your mind, you go and you see a, so, a clinical social worker or a counselor, maybe a psychiatrist, who of course is a, a doctor. But in any case, that mind body dualism, I think, gets in the way of us understanding that ultimately there is no difference between the mind and the body. In fact, some writers, <clears throat> they drop the hyphen mind body, they, they just write one word body mind or mind body. Um, and I think it's um, all healthcare providers. And I, I, I think we really have to accept this fact that 
what ha whatever ha has happened to you mentally will have, if, if it was traumatic especially will come out and somehow it will come out and it, it it's not usually a very pleasant experience <clears throat> but as i said we have this uh assumption we make about mind body dualism that i can i can deal with my mind and not worry about my body or just deal with my body not worry about my mind but ideally we should take a holistic view and assume that what happens physically affects my mind what happens mentally affects my physiology thank you uh next up is max thank you thank you brian um brian i had a question um as you're talking about emotions and thoughts and uh, observing those that is reminding me a lot about the meditation and in terms of meditation specifically the either the dualistic view not the same dualistic you were just talking about but the is there a thinker inside my head who is thinking is there like um a seer who is seeing or even you know subject object type perspective or even non-dualistic the maybe more sophisticated sort of view um where there's just emptiness and there are these emotions and thoughts that arise come and go can you comment on that at all or is that meditation view totally out of scope of what we're talking about here thank you um now thank you for your question uh that's a very uh deep question um it it most definitely does relate to what i'm interested in and i think what we're talking about um this idea of um of a, of a thinker um so I think another way to put it is who or what is thinking my thoughts. And the reason why we even ask that question is because a certain feature of conscious interiority that I call the I in quotation marks um, is existing in this mind space. And the I is observing what's going on in this mind space. And basically that's what consciousness is. So from a certain angle, that's actually an illusion that the eye is separate from the mind from or from whatever we're observing. Um, you know, we can, and, and, and related to this, to make things a little more complicated, is this idea of the me in quotations. And this, the, the me is another uh, feature of conscious interiority. And so the I is what I call a subject object. And then the me is uh, uh, the object, the thing that is observed. How do they relate? And we usually, most of us do not think in such a technical way, but if you have try to meditate, of course, we start to ask these questions, I think, once we get deeply into meditation, what is, I see all these thoughts parading across my mind, but where is the I, or how does the I relate to these things? And, the, and I would say that it's, the I is almost an illusion in, in a sense. I'm not saying that the I is not real. I'm certainly not saying the I plays no role. I'm just saying it's an illusion in the sense that we get confused because we take a dualistic view toward everything. We assume that the I is different from the mind. We have assumed that the I can be neatly separated from the me, when in fact, the I and the mind are really coming from the same source, or you might say that the I is arising from the mind as a, as a, as a sort of a, a, tech, a mental technique to increase conscious interiority and is looking down on the mental landscape. Um, so, the, so it's sort of, I, the, I think a good metaphor, if, if I may, is if we view the mind as um, the ocean with waves and the tips of the waves where the waves crest are um, thoughts and emotions. And every once in a while, um, a drop from, a, from the ocean because of the waves will separate from the water and temporarily will exist. And that ex temporary existence of a drop of water above the waves gives us the dualistic 
illusion that there is a thinker that can be ultimately separated, that can be ontologically separated from the ocean or from the mind. So, I, you know, th this is a very deep, very philosophical topic. And, um, and I'm more than happy to talk about it, but, you know, hopefully I'm not sure if that makes sense, but, you know, one thing I would suggest to you is to uh, look at the different features of conscious interiority, the I and the me, and how all these things uh, relate to each other. Thank you. I'll just make one comment and I'll be quiet. Thank you very much. In my practice, personally, I can speak that I am now trying to get to a point where um, I'm past the dualistic view and really trying to turn attention back into the, and try and see the seer or the thinker and really find emptiness instead. But anyway, thank you very much. Oh, thank you. Sorry. Uh, thank you, Max. Uh, next up is Govert. Govert, go ahead. We can't hear you. Looks like there is a problem you have with the mic. Uh, can you go ahead and type your question? Wonderful. Um, let's do one thing, uh, Brian. Um, we have a little bit of time. Can we go ahead and put up that list that you have of all the uh, characteristics, that the, the foci? Um, okay, you, I'll put up the, uh, the PowerPoint again. Yes. Okay. And that slide where you summarize all the aspects of conscious interiority. Is, uh, can you see it? Yes, uh, except that you, yeah, you need to maximize it still. Is, uh, yeah, perfect. is it? Perfect. Okay. perfect. Uh, yeah, this one. Okay, um, so, so folks, uh, some of you uh, have been here for many of these presentations and some of you have been here only for a few of them. Some, for some of you, it's the first presentation in this series. Um, so, Maybe we can spend a couple of, uh, at least, uh, you know, maybe five minutes on these features of conscious interiority. Um, so Brian, could you give an overview of what this concept is? Sure. So the reason why I came up with this list is uh, because when we talk about conscious interiority, people confuse it with a lot of different things. They confuse it with perception. They confuse it with thinking. They confuse, they, they, they confuse it with all sorts of, of different concepts. But the way Jane's use conscious interiority and the way I use it, it's quite restricted actually. But in order to understand exactly what Jane's meant by it, we have to break it down into these, this list of features. There, there may be more features um, Jane's only introduced about five or six of these features I have listed here. Uh, Brian, let me, let me comment on one thing. I think this, the point that you made today, and you made it many times actually, that the concepts of consciousness that people use are really not well defined. And yes. people mean all kinds of different things by them. And in, uh, in a very fundamental way, the modern dialogue is dialectic dialogue without having enough respect for the concepts. So people glibly talk about intuition, whereas they mean completely, uh, people who are arguing mean completely different things by intuition, and they still are trying to talk to each other. It's just yeah. not possible. So one of the things that I really like about Julian Jane's approach is that he takes the pains to look at concepts of consciousness and talks about how, where, how did they come to be and tries to establish them very carefully before talking about them. Uh, so that's, uh, you know, I, I, I think that was a great, great observation. Right. Uh, please go on, sir. Um, yeah, so, you know, uh, as Shurkan, as you've already mentioned, some of these I've, I've already talked about. <clears throat> um, if there's any one, any uh, feature in particular that needs clarification, I haven't talked about all of them 
and some of them are more difficult to understand than others. Got it. So, uh, let's let's do one thing. Uh, so, folks, uh, here is your opportunity. If you have a question about any of these that are there on the screen, go ahead and type exclamation mark, and you can ask the question, uh, regardless of whether you have listened to a presentation on these or not. Uh, go ahead and uh, type exclamation mark and ask a question. I always have many questions for Brian, but your questions take priority. So go ahead and ask a question if you'd like. If you have a question about any of these items on, on the list. So the first point I wanted to bring up is the distinction between I and me. Um, okay, Alex asked, could you go over each of them very quickly? Let, let's do that, uh, Brian. Okay, so mental space is the most primitive feature of conscious interiority, simply defined, mental space is the belief that there is something inside my head or my heart or in some cultures my stomach where psychological processes are happening uh that, that that's just a, a simple definition and mental space actually has a a semi perceptual quality to it because in mental space we can observe, we can see ourselves, or we can see something that happened in the past, or we can see something that is gonna to happen to us in the future. So mental space is actually a very mysterious thing because as I've said in the past, right now there's no uh, physical explanation for how we can imagine mental space. But in any case, it's a very powerful fundamental feature of conscious interiority. Then the next feature, introception, that's uh, actually, I would say that in, in, introception uh, is the counterpart to perception or conception. Um, and if you remember earlier today, I, I made a distinction. So introceptual introception, that it describes the quality of mind space. And another way to think about introception, it's sort of quasi-perceptual. How we can have those quasi-perceptions, why our mind's eye can work, why our mind's ear can work, is actually very, uh, I, I think, one of the biggest uh, questions in science. And we're not close to answering that question, actually, I think. But in any case, um, and... So it's in this mental space where mental images occur. Excerption, uh, the way I would explain that is that what happens is we have a collection of thoughts in our mind, but the, the eye will only pick out certain thoughts and chain them together, okay? And sometimes the mind will become obsessed with a certain with something that has been mentally edited. Um, and sometimes it will try to suppress something that has been edited. So exception is, ex describes how conscious interiority picks out certain ideas or thoughts that are parading through our mind. Consilience is difficult to explain. And so I, I maybe I, I, I won't spend too much time on it. We can maybe talk about it later, but consilience Another way to describe it, it has to do with how the mind accommodates new information. And at the perceptual level, the mind is constantly interacting with the environment and updating itself with perception. That's easy to understand. But when you get to the introceptual level, accommodation works a bit differently. And it will, it, the it, it what, what's happening is the mind is trying to assimilate new ideas and chain them together um an example and, and usually consilience the, the way the information is assimilated or accommodated reflects the physical world of uh, many times it doesn't actually and a good example of that is what happens when we dream and when we dream there's an attempt at consilience. There's an attempt to chain things together, but it doesn't make sense. 
um, in, in any case, you know, perhaps I can return to that. Uh, that, that, that that's a feature that uh, admittedly is a little bit difficult to, to explain. A self narratization so if you picture yourself walking down a road, your physical self walking down a road, self narratization is the introceptual version of that, where you have a personal timeline in your head that you imagine, past, present, future. And then self-autonomy is the sense that not just my body, but my eye has control over my actions and my thoughts. Self-authorization can be understood, if we look historically, according to Jane's, in pre-conscious times, people did not have a modern self, as we think of it. Instead, they received their orders and commands from, the, from ancestors and gods. So the ancestors and gods authorized their behavior. But once people became conscious, there was a new entity a new type of authorization. And of course, that would be the self. So the self is giving us permission to act and behave in a certain way. And then I is this illusion that the mind projects, you might say, where we have an observing subject self. And the I is modeled on our physical self, being a subject, being in control, Initiate, initiating action, it's active, where the counterpart, the me, is also our bodily, is an analog of our bodily self, except that it's the passive observed version of our self. And then self-reflexivity, self-reflexivity self is actually very, uh, it, it's, um, I, I usually say that for the last because it's, 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 it, it gets into philosophy. It's a little difficult to understand, um, I think. Self-reflexivity is the indescribable sensation or the indescribable, indescribable sense we all have as individuals that no one else has. We cannot share self, the, the feeling of self-reflexivity. Self-reflexivity is about um, me, a meanness you might say, or a selfness that no other person has. Um, it, it, so it, 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 it's, it's a little difficult to uh, 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 describe. But as I said, if someone wants me to take another attempt at it, I, I'd be more than happy. Um, the problem with self-reflexivity is people confuse it with perception or self-perception, you know, looking in the mirror. So you have these researchers making the claim that because a gorilla looked in the mirror and scratched himself and took off, scratched off paint or something from his fur or whatever, his, you know, his hair. Therefore, he's self-reflexive. And that's complete nonsense, to, in my opinion. Um, self-reflexivity is something completely different from self-perception. Uh, but in any case, the next uh, item, concentration, as I mentioned in, in one of the sl slides, concentration is the psychological analog of attention. So attention is something perceptual, whereas concentration is something that we do um, uh, using conscious interiority, where we focus on something in, the, in our mindscape. Suppression, of course, we talked about today. Self-individuation describes, it's sort of related to self-reflexivity, a little bit different, but self-individuation self is this idea that own that there is something very unique about me that no one else can share, that I am an individual. And of course, we say, oh, people have always had that idea. But if you look at the historical record, I don't think that's true. There's no discussion of individuality in the modern sense uh, when people were pre-conscious. Um, so a lot of these items that I've discussed and listed have come from looking at the historical record seeing what people talked about when during pre-conscious times, and very importantly, seeing what people did not talk about. We assume that people all were capable of these uh, conscious abilities, when in fact, if you look at the historical record, it does not seem to be uh, evidence for, for these particular features. 
So in any case, I, I hope that clarifies it for some people. Wonderful. Thank you, uh, Brian. This is very good. And I'm going to make a separate uh, YouTube video just for this. So we can I can keep referencing it in all the other videos. So uh, just for the sake of completeness, can you describe suppression in a few sentences? Sure. So suppression. <clears throat> so <clears throat> think about how. Um, in fact, maybe I'll, uh, did I have, a, so think about how physically when something threatens us or something disgusts us, we turn away from it, or we run away from it. So that's what we do physically. But suppression is a conscious analog or a conscious version of that behavior. It's something that we do in, uh, internally. Wonderful. Uh, thank you, Brian. Uh, now we have a last question from Govert. He asks regarding meditation, maybe there are the two kinds of meditation. The first kind about observing and em uh, emptying the mind, mind space, Zen based. And second is deconstructing mind space by collapsing the uh, underlying box metaphor that is Krishnamurti. I would add a third type of meditation, which is there, which is kind of, which is concentration based of focusing your attention on something. So any, any, any comments on meditation? Yeah. So, um, well, you know, for what you, what you just said about the concentrating, um, I, I wonder if that sort of overlaps with the observing type that was just mentioned of con of, uh, meditation where you, um, observe intensely something in your mind or perhaps a mantra that is repeated uh, that, that the, the meditator repeats. So, um, so in any case, and then actually, uh, I, I wasn't clear on the second type of um, meditation. Uh, that, that, is, that is very complicated. So let, let's skip that. That's, that's a concept that Krishnamurti has, which is very okay. difficult to explain. I don't think I can explain it. And Gover's uh, mic is not working, so I don't think he will be able to type fast enough to explain because he will need to type for about uh, about three pages to do that. Uh, <laughs> and so the next next up is going to be uh, Dave. You have a quick question, and then we'll close. Oh, you had just exclamation mark, Dave. Okay, all right, wonderful, uh, Brian. Thank you very much. Always, always a delight and always an honor. And we will talk to you soon. Okay. Th All right. Good. Thank you, everybody. Thank very you, very everybody. interesting. Good bye. questions. Bye. Right, bye. Bye now. Um, folks, I want to tell you about the meetups coming up. We've got three new series starting up. The series number one, starting tomorrow, is going to be on the crisis of civilization. It's called the three spheres, East, West, and Digital. What is happening to our world? That's the question that Mark Stallman, the president of the Center for the Study of Digital Life will be answering. So don't miss that. It's going to be spectacular. It's going to be Sundays at 3 p.m. Eastern time. It's an eight session, full-fledged course. It will be, Mark will be giving a lecture and then you'll get to ask all the questions uh, that you have about what is happening to the world. Second series is The Design Way. Uh, this is by Harold Nelson. Harold Nelson himself is attending uh, the series uh, and he's recommending it to his folks on LinkedIn. So we've got a whole bunch of people who have been studying the design way and design for a long time. Uh, we've got a great bunch of panelists. We're going chapter by chapter. That one is starting on Monday. And on Friday, we are starting a new series on the Gospel of John. We have done a spectacular job of, or we are doing a spectacular job of going through Tao, the Jing, want to do the same thing for a part of Bible. And we have chosen the Gospel of John and we will be going through it. We are starting this Friday at 9 p.m. Eastern time. So I hope uh, you can make make it for all of these. In addition to that, on Tuesdays, uh, we do Dao De Jing. On Wednesdays, we are going to be talking about, uh, you know, Mike is going to be presenting on a very interesting topic, use of improvisation 
in your life and in your comprehensivism, how you can apply to any, any field that you're working in or any activity that you're doing. Uh, it's going to be full of exercises, fun exercises. So please uh, don't miss that. And um, so that's what is coming up on Saturdays. We do the series on Louis Sullivan. Uh, that is one of my favorites. Uh, he's my favorite thinker. Uh, and that's coming up at 2.30 today. And we'll continue as well. All right. Thank you very much, everybody. We'll see you soon. Bye.